I wanted to welcome all of you to the 10th annual Matilda White Riley Awards for Excellence in the Behavioral and Social Sciences. Um, I'm Bill Riley, Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences at the NIH and Director of OBSSR. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming and attending. Uh, OBSSR has been around for 22 years, um, and we recently released our third strategic plan. So you'll see actually some of the slides up here as they run through. On that, uh, there's some one-page handouts on it as well in the back. Um, and you can always download the full strategic plan um, on the website. Um, this is uh, the 10 of those last, uh, the last 10 of those 22 years, we've also done the Matilda White Riley Awards um, to honor excellence in behavioral and social sciences um, with this lecture series. There have been some really stellar past uh, recipients of the award, sort of the who's who, I think, of behavioral and social science research. David Mechanic. Carol Reif and Burton Singer, John McKinley, Laura Carstensen, John Cassiopo, Linda Waite, Sam Preston, Kevin Bolt, uh, Jeannie Brooks Gunn, and Karen Lehrman. Um, just a stellar group of people and another stellar person that we'll acknowledge later today in terms of the people who have been part of this. Um, we also honor Matilda White Riley. I was just looking at the slides and realized that she didn't start here until she was 68. Most of us will be retired by the time we're 68. Uh, Matilda decided this was a time to start doing the work at the NIH. Um, she was instrumental, and there's a lot about her on the website, some of the materials that we have. So I'll just, uh, to keep things brief and short, just mention that it, for all extents and purposes, Matilda White Riley was OBSSR before OBSSR existed. Um, she was responsible for behavior and health efforts. She was responsible for work at the National Academies around these issues. She was the voice of behavioral and social sciences for OBSSR, or for the behavioral and social sciences before that, um, and advocated for its importance within uh, the National Institutes of Health for many, many years. So it's, a, it's great to be able to honor her as well as part of these awards. Um, let me go back. Um, so um, last year, I'll, I'll mention as well that you know, we've been doing this for about 10 years. Last year, we added early stage investigator awards for the first year. I think we're really excited to do that. And we have, I think, another excellent panel of early stage investigator paper awards again this year. Last year, awardees were Stephanie Cook, Chris Markham, Ian McDonough, and Sarah Mormon. Um, so a, a really great set of early stage investigators. Uh, before I turn this over to Bill Elwood to introduce um, our early stage investigator paper awardees and their presentations, I'll just remind everyone that this is being both live cast and video cast, so don't say anything that your mother would be upset with you about over the course of the next four hours. Um, and um, I'll now turn this over to Dr. Elwood. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Riley. Uh, um, as he said, I'm Bill Elwood. And last year, we did expand our uh, annual awards to include early stage investigators. Not only uh, um, uh, Bill mentioned that Matilda started at NIH at age 68. When she retired, I believe, 12, year, 12 years later from the National Institutes of Health, she went back to Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine and continued to teach and lead the gerontology section at the American Sociological Association. So when we w looked again at, uh, um, at the honors, we thought it was more than in the spirit of Matilda White Riley to acknowledge current excel excellence, acknowledge our, uh, um, our godmother, if you will, and also uh, include the future, because Matilda was as much about the future as she was about the present. And of course, uh, um, people not growing old in laboratories, growing old in real life, as you saw on the slide. Uh, um, in the next hour, we will hear presentations from our four excellent early stage investigators. You can read about the process online and their extended biographies. Because we have such a limited amount of time, I will turn over the podium to Dr. Erica Fuchs from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Erica. Oops, sorry. Hopefully you can hear me okay. 
So um, as Dr. Elwood said, I'm Erica Fuchs. I am an assistant professor and Birch scholar at the University of Texas Medical Branch currently. Um, the work that I'm presenting today was actually part of my dissertation project done at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. So I'm going to be talking about <laughs> prenatal influenza vaccination and how that um, may predict childhood vaccination before age three. So just a little bit of background information. Outbreaks of vaccine preventable illnesses are currently occurring in pockets of children who are not up to date. You may hear um, or you may have heard about one that's currently occurring in Minnesota where this data comes from right now. Uh, childhood vaccination rates across the country are below ideal levels. Right now about 72% of children are up to date on their vaccinations for the combined seven vaccine series it's shown at the bottom um, by the time that they are three years old. And really, the kids are supposed to have these vaccines before they're 19 months. So that is really lagging behind. There are a lot of reasons for under vaccination, including safety, avoidance of medical interventions, negative experiences and opinions about vaccination, and distrust overall of the medical system. Certainly, there are also um, access issues. Two vaccines right now are recommended to pregnant women. Influenza vaccination has been recommended to uh, prevent mothers from getting influenza during pregnancy since they um, may be at increased risk of influenza complications. The Tdap vaccine as well has been recommended since about 2012, and this is to prevent infants from getting pertussis when, um, before they're able to be vaccinated around two months of age. So babies who get pertussis have a really difficult time, often for several months. And so if the mom gets the Tdap vaccine while she's pregnant, the uh, antibodies for pertussis can protect the baby from pertussis. Um, right now, the uptake of influenza and Tdap vaccines during pregnancy are fairly low. Recent numbers from Minnesota have shown about 46% of women are getting influenza vaccination during or just before pregnancy, and about 58% are getting Tdap vaccination. And around the country, these numbers really vary widely from the low teens of um, uptake to the 70s and 80s, depending on the location, the hospital, uh, where the vaccinations are occurring. And there are similar reasons for vaccine hesitancy in moms, uh, pregnant women, as there are for their children. So far, interventions aiming to increase childhood vaccination have had limited success. These interventions are generally focused at the time of the vaccination visit or um, after the baby's born. There haven't been a lot of prenatal interventions for childhood vaccination. Right now, there is a measles outbreak occurring in the Minneapolis area. Um, these slides are about a week old, and now, so far, as of last night, they have 20 cases, and they are expecting that will greatly increase. Measles, as I'm sure most of you know, is extremely infectious. So far, all of the cases have been in children five years of age or, or younger. Most of the cases have occurred in children ages one, one to five, and children are supposed to be uh, vaccinated for measles at age one. There have only been one or two cases occurring in children zero, um, zero to one years of age, but uh, they do expect that that will increase and babies under the age of one have the worst outcomes from measles. Most of the children have been hospitalized at this point. So the state of Minnesota Department of Health uh, is currently recommending accelerated doses of the MMR vaccine for children who have not yet received their second dose. And that is a common thing that occurs uh, when there is a measles outbreak. <clears throat> the purpose of this study was to examine the relationship between prenatal influenza vaccination and childhood vaccination prior to 36 months of age. This is a standard measurement of childhood vaccine uptake is um, being that they get this entire series before they're three. The purpose was that if prenatal vaccination can it predict childhood vaccination, there may be potential new avenues and strategies for intervention because we'd be able to identify these women um, prior to the time their baby is born. 
So in order to do that, I used data that was already collected by the Minnesota Department of Health, including Minnesota PRAMS data from the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. This is surveillance data that's linked to vital statistics records. And I used the 2009 to 2011 surveys um, because they asked questions about influenza vaccination of the mother, including belief questions, which I didn't um, talk about here, but they were included in that. Uh, the PRAM survey is a weighted random sample of women who had live births in the past, usually three months, so they sample a few times a year, and they have about a 60 to 65% response rate. I also use data from the Minnesota Immunization Information Connection, which is Minnesota's um, immunization surveillance service. And this is a registry that consolidates records um, throughout the state. And 93% of Minnesota children have at least two vaccinations in MIC. Um, there are border sharing agreements so that children who may be going to the doctor in various border states to Minnesota also get their data into this system. There is heavy follow-up um, from the MIC staff. The measures that I used were prenatal influenza vaccines, self-reported from PRAMS. Maternal demographic characteristics also self-reported to PRAMS. Childhood vaccination, which is reported by providers to MIC. Invalid records are excluded, and that means that if a child got a vaccination uh, too early or at the wrong time point, um, that was excluded from being a valid dose. And child age was also obtained from MIC, which is um, coming from the birth, birth certificate record. The analyses I used were survey commands and STATA to take into account the PRAMS weights, because PRAMS is designed to be a representative sample of uh, the births that are occurring in the state for each year. And I used chi-squared tests and t-tests, as well as logistic regression for odds ratios, margins commands to predict risks and risk differences. So this is a table just showing some of the characteristics of the um, moms who were in the data set. The children were over four years of age at the time that the data was exported from the MIC system, but I only used records that occurred prior to the age of three. As you can see, um, there are some differences, uh, especially with education. The moms who got the flu vaccination were slightly more educated. They were also um, more likely to have a higher income and slightly more likely to have private medical insurance. There were no differences in race, ethnicity, parity, and child age. So from the final analyses, <laughs> vaccine series completion was very different between the moms who received the flu vaccine and who did not receive the flu vaccine. Um, in the adjusted model, the moms who had the flu vaccine um, were 10% more likely to have kids who were complete on their vaccine records. And this may be because of beliefs or access that was not assessed in this particular paper. And these results also carried through to each of the different vaccines that are in the series, ranging from MMR or Hib with the lowest difference between groups and um, Hep B with the highest difference between groups. But approximately 10% difference. So there were large significant differences between groups for all outcomes. Um, some of the limitations of the study is that when you use survey weights, you make assumptions about homogeneity between the groups or within the groups. There was a really small amount of missing data. There were only six moms in the data set out of around 4,000 who didn't have a matching baby. Demographic information was missing from about 7% of the mothers. Um, obviously, self-report of influenza vaccine received is a huge limitation, um, but that was not consistently captured by MIC itself, so I used the self-reported method. And I didn't discuss beliefs here. So what does this mean? Mothers who reported that they had a prenatal influenza vaccination were more likely to have children who were up-to-date on vaccines before three years of age. Some of the implications are that early, identifi early identification of those at risk of under-vaccinating their children may be possible. 
So if a pregnant woman comes into practice and refuses a vaccination, you might use that opportunity or the next opportunity you have to talk about child vaccination with her. Um, and there may be a general skepticism of medicine and healthcare among the mothers who are declining uh, prenatal vaccinations. So as I said, there's potential for early targeted interventions. Um, usually multi-pronged inter interventions are recommended so something that can um, assess the beliefs of the mother. Provider recommendation remains one of the most important predictors of vaccination, so making sure that the providers are actually recommending it each time. And um, doing some kind of reminder, text, email, having a phone call follow up, those can all help. So just my references here. Um, the first one is the uh, health department um, the second is my citation for this paper. And I want to thank my current funder, which is the Office of Research on Women's Health here. Um, I'm a Birch Scholar, and I wanna thank Mick and Minnesota Prams as well for providing the assistance to get this data. It was a many year process to get this data and merge them together between two different groups of the health department, and I don't want to understate the um, help that they provided in doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, if you have questions, please note them down because uh, um, all four of our doctors will speak and then we'll bring them up on stage for your questions. Uh, um, so please help me welcome Dr. Emily Homan from the Pennsylvania State University. Emily? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, talk about my research today. Um, the study that I'm going to be talking about is a NIH-funded um, clinical trial. And I probably don't need to convince you that child obesity is an issue in the U.S., but for a little bit of context, one out of every three children are overweight or obese by their fifth birthday. Um, and Across childhood, this is roughly 17% of children and adolescents who are obese. So risk starts in infancy, and in fact, even before infancy, but um, there are mixed findings about the associations between infant diet and obesity risk, and most of what's been studied is breastfeeding and the timing of introduction to complementary foods. Uh, a number of studies have shown a protective association between breastfeeding and obesity risk though some propose that this may be due to residual confounding factors, such as socioeconomic status, and also early introduction of complementary foods, um, typically before four months, have been associated with greater weight, although this could be due to reverse causality, where infants who are already heavier are introduced to solid foods earlier. Less work has been done on infant dietary patterns. This is a figure from a um, paper from a grad student who works worked with um, the group I'm in at Penn State, looking at dietary patterns among nine-month-old infants in the Infant Feeding Practices II study. And she found three, uh, five different dietary patterns among these infants and found that those that had a diet characterized by mixed breast and formula feeding, as well as high energy density foods, such as French fries and sugar-sweetened beverages, had the highest uh, rates of overweight at one year. So uh, I looked at dietary patterns using a similar, similar approach in our um, intervention study, which is the Intervention Nurses Start Infants Growing on Healthy Trajectories, or INSIGHT study. Um, and this is a birth to three-year intervention where we recruited first-time moms um, and randomized them to a responsive parenting intervention or child safety control um, right at two weeks of age. And these intervention curricula, which I'll talk a little bit more about, were delivered um, at home visits by nurses across the first year of life, and then also at clinic visits um, through three years of age. And so far to date, we've published results showing that our responsive parenting intervention um, has had beneficial effects on infant weight gain. So infants in the intervention had slower weight gain from birth to six months. Uh, lower mean weight for length percentile and a lower prevalence of overweight in one year. And we also um, have seen beneficial effects on infant sleep. 
So our intervention is responsive parenting, um, which is defined as mothers or caregivers prompt, contingent, and appropriate interaction with their child. And there's a number, number uh, a variety of research showing that responsive parenting is associated with many beneficial outcomes for the child, um, including uh, language development, emotional health, and what we're most interested in, weight status. Uh, so we focused on teaching responsive parenting principles across all the various behavioral domains that infants uh, experience, so sleeping, fussing and soothing, active social play, and then feeding, which is what I will focus most on. So the aims of my paper were to look at uh, dietary intake um, amongst nine-month-old infants participating in Insight to determine whether dietary patterns differed between the intervention and control group, and to assess the relationship between dietary patterns at nine months and BMI percentile at two years. Our sample is uh, 279 um, healthy first-time mothers and their singleton healthy newborns. Um, we recruited both breastfeeding and formula feeding mothers in this study as well. Our curriculum was very extensive and, like I said, covered um, domains of sleep, fussing, soothing, et cetera. Um, but just a quick overview of some of our feeding messaging. Um, we included info not only on what to feed, um, but also when and how to feed. So for what to feed, we uh, emphasized that infants should only be consuming breast milk or formula for uh, the first four to six months of life. And then once uh, solids were introduced, we focused on um, providing healthy and uh, age-appropriate portion sizes. We talked about when to feed, focusing on hunger and fullness cues and feeding in response to those, as well as some feeding milestones. And for how to feed, we um, this was the largest part of our curriculum. We taught messaging such as don't uh, pressure your child to finish a bottle, um, uh, encourage repeated exposure to novel foods such as vegetables to help encourage liking and acceptance of these, to establish mealtime routines and limit setting, and to um, avoid using food as a reward or to control behavior. Um, and this is just a, a sampling of our messaging. For this analysis, I use latent class analysis to uh, identify discrete mutually exclusive classes of dietary patterns based on responses to food frequency questionnaire at nine months. And uh, this technique allows us to identify groups of individuals that share similar characteristics. So the dietary variables we looked at were breastfeeding, which we defined as less than or greater than or equal to 80% uh, of feeds from breast milk, and a similar um, dichotomization for formula. And for complementary foods, uh, we would have liked to use dietary guidelines, but there currently are not di dietary guidelines for birth to 24 years months, um, soon to change, hopefully. And um, so instead, we use the child and adult care food program meal guidelines for eight to 11 month old infants to guide our analysis. And we categorized intake as less than or greater than or equal to recommendations, um, as well as for foods that are not recommended for infants, such as French fries and sugar sweetened beverages, we categorize those as zero or more than zero times per day. So I'll talk a little bit about the five patterns that we identified um, to orient you to these figures. Um, the food categories are listed on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the item response probability, which is the probability of the child consuming these items uh, uh, given membership in this class. And I've highlighted um, the bars in green showing the most um, interesting or important uh, foods in each pattern. So the first we labeled as breastfed fruits, fruits and vegetables, which was about 24% of infants. Um, these infants had a high probability of consuming breast milk, as well as vegetables and fruit. Our second pattern, 10% uh, of the sample, we labeled as breastfed low variety. These infants had a high probability of consuming breast milk, but compared to the previous pattern, um, a much lower probability of consuming uh, fruits and vegetables. Our third pattern, formula, fruits, and vegetables. These infants had a high probability of consuming formula and a high probability of consuming fruits and vegetables. 
Our fourth and largest class was formula low variety. These infants had a high probability of consuming formula um, and compared to the previous class, a relatively low probability of consuming fruits and vegetables. And this was about 40% of the sample. And our fifth class had a high probability of consuming formula, uh, fruits and vegetables, but compared to the other four classes had also a high probability of consuming juice, sweet drinks, sweet foods and french fries. Um, so we labeled this pattern formula high energy density. Uh, we looked at whether maternal characteristics predicted um, membership in these classes. And so relative to the breastfed fruits and vegetables class, mothers who were older, had higher incomes, were married or had more education were less likely to have infants consuming the formula low variety or formula high energy density class patterns. And mothers with higher pre-pregnancy BMI were more likely to have these patterns. Mothers who returned to work by three months were more likely to be in the formula low variety class. Uh, we wanted to look at whether our intervention moved the needle on these patterns at all. So this is the percent of participants in each class. And what we saw was that our responsive parenting group um, had a greater percentage of infants in the formula, fruits, and vegetables class compared to control where uh, they had a lower percentage in the formula, low variety, and formula, high energy density class um, compared to control. Uh, however, we didn't see much difference in the two breastfed classes. And finally, we wanted to look at how these patterns related to later weight outcomes. And what we saw was that the lowest BMIs at two years were among the breastfed fruits and vegetables and the formula fruits and vegetables classes. So regardless of milk feeding type, um, those infants consuming a dietary pattern rich in these healthy complementary foods appear to have the healthiest weight outcomes. So in conclusion, our responsive parenting intervention um, did seem to shift the dietary patterns among infants who were predominantly formula fed later in infancy. So they had dietary patterns that were greater in fruits and vegetables um, compared to control. However, we didn't see this effect among breastfed infants. And that these dietary patterns in later infancy are related to weight in early childhood. And I just wanted to acknowledge all of um, my co-authors and our PIs, Ian Paul and Leanne Birch, and my um, supervisor, Jen Savage. Thanks. Thanks so much, Emily. Please help me welcome Dr. Frank Inferna from Arizona State University in Tempe. Frank? Thank you for the committee for the opportunity to present in this capacity and also like to thank my co-author on this project, Sonia Luther, for her insightful comments and feedback. In this paper, our focus is examining the multidimensional nature of resilience to spousal loss. And the resilience literature has a long and storied history dating back to the 1960s and 70s. Researchers such as Garmazy, Werner, and Rudder were examining positive adaptation in children who grew up in adverse life circumstances such as maltreatment, poverty, and war. And more recently, a resilience literature has um, been come more to the forefront in the literature in adulthood and old age, and that's really where my interest is in. And broadly speaking, resilience literature is concerned with individual variations in response to risk. And what do I mean by this? So we see in this conceptual figure, individuals may be functioning at various levels, is, yeah, point of, or at various levels, and then with the onset of an acute trauma or disaster, for example, spousal loss, divorce, or unemployment, individuals may follow various trajectories or paths. So some individuals may show growth, so sustained improvements in the outcome of interest following the adversity. Others may show a resilient trajectory of stable, healthy levels of functioning, whereas others may show a recovery trajectory of declines followed by improvements to near previous levels of functioning, whereas other individuals may show sustained declines um, 
in the years following or the time following the adversity. And in the adulthood and old age literature on resilience, the uh, most prominent conceptual model is shown here. And as you can see, it's been conceptualized and found that there could be up to six different trajectories or paths that individuals may follow. And the methodological approach that is used to uh, identify these sorts of trajectories is well, longitudinal data is needed, but the use of growth mixture modeling, which allows for the extraction of these various uh, trajectories, as you can see here. And really, the big take home message that has been observed within the literature in adulthood and old age is that this resilient trajectory of stable, healthy levels of functioning, as shown here, is the modal response. So, most individuals will show this uh, resilient trajectory following. Uh, various major life stressor. And this has been shown across a wide array of adversities is just a sampling um, that is listed here and that a resilient trajectory has been found to be modal. In going through the literature, my colleagues and I, we've observed there are these two key issues that we think are uh, significant and important to examine within the literature. And the first one we've explored in a previous paper where we examine, uh, where we focus more on the methodological approach and the methodological assumptions underlying uh, findings pertaining to resilience and that we found that the proportion of individuals who are deemed resilient is de heavily dependent on the methodological assumptions, particularly the homogeneity of variance across groups. Um, for this paper in particular, we wanted to focus on the second key issue that we've observed is that in an overwhelming number of studies that have examined resilience using growth mixture modeling, more than 80% have focused on one outcome of interest. And typically it's been either depressive symptoms or life satisfaction. And really the big picture question that we've been asking ourselves and really thinking about within the broader context of the literature is that how can we be certain that resilience is a modal response to major life stressors when only one outcome is typically examined? So this is uh, assuming that the one outcome of interest, whether it be life satisfaction or depressive symptoms, is really a proxy for overall uh, good functioning across multiple domains for the individual. And so Within this paper, we really want to emphasize and focus on incorporating a multidimensional approach to studying resilience um, in adulthood and old age. Um, in particular, so this is a long history with lifespan developmental research and developmental psychology is long. I uh, acknowledge that there are different subcomponents within various domains. So for example, focusing on subjective well-being not only is there life satisfaction, but also how is it that positive and negative affect potentially change similarly or not in relation to various adversities. So are similar patterns of resilience found across dimensions of well-being and also other prominent health indices. Uh, second important um, this, our consideration is really thinking about whether resilience in particular outcomes, say life satisfaction, because that coexist with declines in other domains of functioning. So if individuals are showing a resilient trajectory for life satisfaction, does this also uh, correspond to a resilient trajectory for other dimensions, such as positive affect and also dimensions of health? And lastly, um, we think this has important implications for statements centered on resilience. So this can help um, potentially better understand the nature of resilience to major life stressors and whether various stressors have differential effects depending on the outcome of interest. And so here are three aims or uh, research questions for this particular study. So first we were interested in examining trajectories of, of change across five outcomes, so three pertaining to subjective well-being, life satisfaction, positive affect, and negative affect, and two outcomes pertaining to the health domain, so general perceptions of health and physical functioning. And our second goal is to examine the degree to which that there's concordance across each of the outcomes, so how many 
outcomes are individuals shown to be resilient and across the five outcomes we focus on. And lastly, we're interested in what are some of the factors that uh, promote or are predictive of resilient outcomes. To address our research questions, we use data from the Household Income and Labor Dynamics of Australia study, or HILDA. It's an ongoing interdisciplinary nationwide panel survey that assesses participants across a wide range of uh, psychological, sociological, and economic outcomes on an annual basis. And so we use data on 421 participants who reported losing their spouse over the course of the study. Our three, outcome, our three measures of subjective well-being that we utilize in this study are life satisfaction, negative affect, and positive affect, and these measures are assessed at each annual wave. In our two outcome measures pertaining to the health domain are general perceptions of health and also physical functioning, and again, these are assessed at each annual wave. And then in terms of predicting what's uh, linked to resilient outcomes. In addition to sociodemographic factors, we include these three uh, predictors that broadly relate to social resources, uh, anticipating reliable comfort, one's social connectedness within their uh, network, and also their uh, everyday role functioning or emotional functioning. And to analyze our data, we realigned each individual's time series in relation to the year of the reported spousal loss. And also we use growth mixture modeling to examine whether there are these distinct trajectories of change or these groups of individuals. So now to our results, so what did we find? So we found that the proportion of individuals who are resilient differed across the outcomes examined. So we see here looking at life satisfaction, we observed that 66% of our sample were likely to belong to this resilient trajectory of stable, high levels of life satisfaction, whereas 34% of our sample were likely to belong to this recovery trajectory of substantial declines, followed by gradual improvements in the years following uh, spouse loss. Hmm. But when looking at the other indicators of subjective well-being, we see a, a different picture emerges. We see that for negative affect, only 19% of the sample were likely to belong to this resilient trajectory of stable low levels of negative affect. And focusing on positive affect, only 26% of the sample were likely to belong to this resilient trajectory of stable high levels. Uh, we find a similar uh, pattern emerge with focusing on the two health domains and that we, across the two, we found that there were uh, fewer participants who were likely to belong to the resilient trajectory as shown here for general health and similarly for physical functioning. And so these lines or these model implied trajectories really only tell one side of the story. So there's a great deal of variability in terms of within in between the classes, and this is shown here. So just focusing on the life satisfaction outcome, we see that as a group, the resilient trajectory is showing greater stability within and across individuals in terms of showing stable high levels before and after spousal loss, whereas focusing on the recovery class, we see that there's a great deal of variability in terms of their levels of functioning and also how much they are changing in the years leading up to and following spousal loss. So in a second step, uh, we wanted, we outputted the probable class membership, so the likelihood that individuals would belong to particular um, groups or domains, and we found that across all of the participants, only 8% showed a, what we call across the board resilience, or they were likely to belong to the resilient trajectory um, in all five outcomes, whereas a uh, far larger proportion, 20%, were likely to not be resilient in any of the five outcomes. And when looking at what is it that predicted the likelihood of belonging to more resilient outcomes, we found that uh, individuals who reported higher levels of social resources, this, was, this promoted resilience across 
more outcomes. So to briefly summarize, so we found that the likelihood of resilience or the proportion of individuals showing resilience is dependent on the outcome of interest. Um, and really thinking about this more broadly conceptually in terms of um, the importance of incorporating a multidimensional approach and examining multiple pertinent outcomes when studying resilience to adversity and that re uh, resilience coexists, can coexist with declines in other outcomes or pertinent domains of functioning. If individuals are showing a stable high trajectory of resilience for life satisfaction, that may not translate to other domains as we have shown here and that there's a great deal of cross-domain variability in that um, the proportion of resilient of individuals showing resilience or exhibiting resilience is going to depend it's going to depend on the number and the types of outcomes examined if we had solely focused on life satisfaction then a very different picture would have emerged in terms of how we would have uh, conveyed our findings and our results um, this doesn't mean or we're not advocating for a kitchen sink approach. I think the outcomes that need to be examined should be conceptually relevant to the adversity that is being uh, studied. Um, our study is not without limitation. So longitudinal panel surveys are great in that they afford the opportunity to look at long-term change. Um, However, we're constrained in being able to study the processes uh, underlying resilience and also the types and number of pertinent vulnerability and protective factors that we can include. So in future research, we're interested in looking at or applying this approach to uh, other major life stressors, including chronic health um, illness and also disability onset and really expanding beyond the health and well-being domain uh, to other pertinent outcomes, um, such as one's connection with uh, others, character strengths and virtues, um, and also what are the various processes underlying resilience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Frank. Uh, now our uh, last, but certainly not least, Early stage investigator is Dr. Jacqueline Torres from the University of California, San Francisco. Jackie. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So there is a broad body of scholarship linking integration within family and community networks to a whole variety of health outcomes, mental health, physical health, cognitive, functioning, and so forth. But a lot of this work has not examined in detail the specific context of social ties for immigrants and their family members in the US and worldwide. So national survey data from 2008 suggests that among foreign-born Latinos, the largest immigrant population in the US, 40% report making weekly phone calls to family and friends in places of origin in Latin America. 52% report sending remittances or sending money to family or friends in places of origin. And it turns out that going back to even early 20th century sociology, there's been this long tradition of sociologists and even anthropologists observing these cross-border connections that immigrants maintain to family and friends in places of origin and the emotional, symbolic, financial implications of those connections. So until a couple of years ago, there hasn't really been consideration of how these cross-border connections might impact health and how those might be unique impacts as, as compared to local, uh, the impacts of local social immigration. So the motivating question for this paper is, is there a relationship between cross-border social integration, social ties, and depression? So I look at depression in this paper and expand to look at other physical health outcomes uh, in other papers. And it's important that I look at this longitudinally given the potential for reciprocal associations between social integration broadly and cross-border social integration in particular and depression outcomes. So I want to look at the impact of baseline cross-border ties on subsequent depression 
and being able to control for baseline depression to account for some of those reciprocal associations. But let's step back, and I want to tell you about some potential mechanisms that my colleagues and I have been thinking through in linking cross-border ties to depression in particular, but other health outcomes, broadly speaking. So qualitative researchers um, have identified that cross-border ties, cross-border connections, might provide a unique a source of social support and sense of belonging within a broader uh, cross-border family network, a broader ethno-national community, affording a sense of ethnic identity, and that these supportive connections may be particularly important as immigrants face social isolation and discrimination in uh, places and destination communities. On the flip side, cross-border ties, as unique from local social ties, necessarily exist in a context of cross-border separation. That is, individuals are connecting, sending money across borders because they have been separated as the result of migration, whether chosen or not. In addition, uh, there's been a lot of work, including some of my own qualitative work, suggesting that cross-border ties continue to entail caregiving, uh, that, uh, that immigrants and their family members are continuing to parent to coordinate the logistics of long-term care and medical care for older adults so that these ties may include not only kind of instrumental exchanges of money, uh, reports of one's daily activities, but also really kind of entail the burden and the obligations of continuing to provide care for family members. Uh, also, as uh, potentially important for other health outcomes, these cross-border ties might serve as a channel of continued influence around behaviors, norms, and preferences including norms around consumption of, of alcohol, um, tobacco, uh, uh, other kinds of food consumption, health-seeking behavior, and so forth that might be important for other health outcomes. Finally, these cross-border ties almost always include uh, transfers of money, so sending remittances, and these remittances may um, uh, may be linked to financial strain if they provide a heavy financial burden on immigrants and their family members facing socioeconomic disadvantage here, but they can also act, have kind of more positive implications for mental well-being and sense of self, and that they may serve as an act of altruism, a marker of socioeconomic mobility, and um, uh, give one a sense of having fulfilled the obligations uh, connected to the contract uh, around migration. In addition to these general mechanisms, there are a lot of sources of heterogeneity in the relationship between cross-border ties and health, potentially. That's what we're kind of continuing to investigate. I won't go through all of these, but I'm going to focus on potential differences by gender and nativity. So in particular, sociologists have identified that women may um, face greater burden in kind of provide, continuing to provide care across borders, continuing to kind of maintain family networks both here and there. And so there may be um, more robust, but also some negative implications for women that may not be um, attributed to men. In addition, nativity, we think that these ties might have um, more robust implications for the health outcomes of immigrant populations relative to their US-born children, given that those ties are likely um, uh, less distal and kind of you know, more uh, links to, um, <clears throat> to close family members versus extended family members. So I hypothesize, even despite kind of some of those potentially negative um, uh, associations between cross-border ties and health, that overall I'll see this significant positive association with, between baseline cross-border ties and lower levels of subsequent depression in a sample of immigrants and U.S.-born children of immigrants. And then I expect that this relationship will vary by nativity and gender, possibly some weaker associations for men, um, as well as U.S.-born respondents. And the data I'm using here that, uh, come from the Sacramento area Latino study on aging, the SALSA study, uh, which ran between 1998 and 2008. It included, it included 1,789 respondents um, at baseline, and half, about half were um, primarily of Mexican origin immigrants, and then uh, the other half were U.S.-born children of um, Mexican immigrants, so Mexican-American and follow-up waves were repeated every 12 to 18 months after baseline. So here are the measures I use from SALSA. 
So the primary exposure that I'm interested in is whether respondents reported talking to family and friends in Latin America at baseline. So they were asked, how often do they talk to family and friends? And they said, never, almost never, always or often. And we cut this measure a bunch of different ways. You can look at our ancillary analyses in the paper. But we decided for our primary analysis to contrast those who reported never talking to family and friends to those who reported always, often, or almost never. And this is in part theoretically driven by qualitative work as well as some emerging empirical work indicating that even very distal connections, even very infrequent connections across borders can pro has huge symbolic and emotional value for immigrants and their family members. We also looked at frequency of travel to Latin America at baseline, again, uh, measured similarly, and we used it similarly in our primary analyses, but we also had time frame measures of travel um, at each study wave, as well as, and cut it a lot of different ways, as I mentioned. Our outcome is the 20 item centers for epidemiologic studies, depression scale, and for, for our primary analyses, we contrast respondents with scores of 16 or greater to those with scores of less than 16. And we also look at continuous outcomes as well. So our covariates, we control for baseline depression. Remember that was critical, given that we want to kind of account for some of those reciprocal associations between cross-border social integration and depression. We control for a number of measures of local social integration, the availability of individuals to provide care, daily contact with a close community or family member, marital status, age, income, and then we control for a number of measures of um, needs for assistance with activities of daily living, as well as chronic and acute health conditions, given that we're looking at that measure of travel. So we need to account for the fact that people might not be traveling simply because they're physically not able to. So for our analytic sample, we're left with 1,270 people because we needed everyone to have at least one follow-up wave. Remember, we're measuring baseline cross-border ties and their association with subsequent depression. And then we had um, some people drop out because of incomplete social integration data. We do some reweighting, and I won't go through all the details there, but we, we reweight the respondents to account in part for the bias due to, to all that dropout. And then we um, get some results. But first, I'm going to show you that some of the um, sample characteristics about 44% of the sample report talking to family and friends in Latin America, even just a little bit at baseline. About 50% reported any even very limited travel to Latin America about 50% are foreign-born. Um, and the mean age of this cohort was 70 years old at baseline, so it's an older cohort. Um, almost a third of women and 15% of men reported CESD scores of 16 or greater at baseline. And now to the results. So this is, for, this is women here only. Um, and so we find that there are no um, significant main effect associations between baseline talking or traveling across borders with subsequent depression. Uh, and FB here means foreign born. However, when we interact, we look at the interactions between cross-border ties and nativity, foreign born status, uh, we find there are significant interactions in the association between cross-border ties and nativity with subsequent depression. Since the numbers are hard to understand, I'll show you pictures. Um, and what do we find? We find that immigrant women who report any talking to family and friends at baseline have the highest predicted probability of subsequent depression. So totally in contrast to the, what I hypothesize is this kind of overall protective association. In contrast, US-born women reporting uh, even a little bit of talking to family and friends in Latin America at baseline had the lowest predicted probability of subsequent depression. So this kind of diverging, um, a divergent result of uh, the association between cross-border ties and subsequent depression based on by nativity, uh, at least for women. And these results were very similar for them when using the measure of travel and kind of all the other checks that we did looking at continuous um, depressive symptoms and so forth. Now for men, there is no significant association between baseline um, talking to family and friends in Latin America and subsequent depression. There was this significant protective association between reporting any travel to Latin America at baseline 
and lower odds of subsequent depression. There are no significant interaction effects between each of these measures of cross-border ties and nativity in the association with subsequent depression, however. So we'll just look, though, at the predicted probabilities um, of CESD scores of 16 or greater based on that travel measure. So again, those men who reported any travel to Latin America had the lowest predicted probability of CESD scores of 16 or greater subsequently. So a summary of the findings. So there are significant associations between uh, both measures of cross-border ties at baseline and subsequent depression for women, but the direction of the association varied by nativity, protective for US-born women and a risk factor for Latin American-born women. Uh, and then for men, we found only that significant main effect association between travel and lower odds of subsequent depression. So the implications of these findings and other work that my colleagues and I are doing around cross-border ties and health, so we know that social integration, support, strain, and loneliness are widely considered to be determinants of population health, but the specific context of these social factors, including their cross-border nature, needs to be considered as a social determinant of health for immigrants and their family members. And this may also include the thinking about the role of cross-border separation as a determinant of health for immigrants and their family members. And just to put this in context, 13% of US residents are immigrants and 3.3% of the world's population are international migrants. And this applies to many other contexts as well. Um, so I think uh, some of the clinical, community, and public health implications that we've thought about are thinking about the, nature, these cro the cross-border nature of these ties for social or family support interventions, for caregivers, and so forth, uh, that may be immigrants. And so I've been thinking a lot about applying these, uh, thinking about the feasibility of um, leveraging cross-border family ties uh, within caregiver interventions, but also thinking about the burden of cross-border caregiving. Uh, and thinking about, again, at the end of life, long-term, and end-of-life care coordination, which is something that has come out of my qualitative work around this issue. So I want to acknowledge my um, co-authors, especially um, my mentor, Mary Hahn, who is the principal investigator of the SALSA study, which was funded um, by the National Institute on Aging um, and other mechanisms through the National Institutes of Health. Um, and here's the information on this paper. And please feel free to email me with any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Jackie. And uh, panelists, if you'd make your way up, uh, um, up to stage to join Jackie. In whatever order you'd like. <laughs> this is America. And now it's time for you all to talk. What questions do you have of our panelists? Dr. Spots. Ah, there we go. Sorry, technically challenged. Um, I had a question for Erica. Um, so I know you have the data on whether or not the mothers were vaccinated. Do you know if they were offered vaccinations? Because um, it may be that it's not part of a, a standard protocol that the um, doctors are. For influenza vaccination, it should have been start, you know, a standard protocol at the time that the women were receiving, um, were doing you know, having prenatal care during this time. And there is self-reported data on whether the women were offered it. Um, but because PRAMS is not done until, you know, maybe up to three months after a woman has given birth, we just weren't quite sure if that was data that was very good. Um, but provider recommendation, just like anything else, did predict um, all of the outcomes in this study as well. And so did all of the other maternal beliefs that you would expect. They just weren't included in this paper due to space. So, yeah. I, I also have a, a question for Dr. Fuchs. Um, so I'm wondering, let me phrase my question in the form of a comment. Um, I'm wondering about the, uh, first of all, I was surprised to see that you have 65% of, of women uh, uh, fascinated. That's pretty much the population parameter. That's pretty much right on target for that, for influenza. Among the 35% uh, or so that aren't vaccinated, what fraction of that do you expect to be actionable in terms of targeting for intervention? Because it 
think with vaccination, influenza vaccination research, there's a fraction of those that just will never vaccinate. What's your expectation? I agree that there is um, a group of people that just will always refuse, and we have to kind of accept that at this point, that that is just um, going to be the case. Um, but most, most women will get the vaccine if their provider recommends it. So I think that what would be helpful in this case is actually to have a system that has better um, follow-up and tracking of the doses that are given for vaccination for influenza because, for example, I'm sure, you know, here they probably have flu vaccine clinics. So um, usually if that happens on a work site, those aren't included in things like immunization registries. So there actually may be um, women who are forgetting that they did that. They might not be reporting in immunization systems. Um, it might be occurring a couple months before the pregnancy, which would be fine because you can get vaccinated before your pregnancy and that'll still protect you during your pregnancy, of course. Um, so if women aren't thinking back, you know, to the three months before they got pregnant and remembering it, that just might not be captured as well. So, you know, maybe there is a small portion of women who just will always refuse to be vaccinated, but as long as providers are consistently recommending it and as long as we have a lot of opportunities for vaccination, I think that um, we can achieve higher vaccination targets. Okay, Dr. Spittle. Thank you. Um, I found all the talks very interesting. Uh, I'd like to ask Frank a question. So my, I think you did a stellar job at unpacking heterogeneity in, in this resilient question. Um, you, you made a compelling case why focusing on one outcome is probably not in the interest if you want to understand resilience. Equivalently, you focus on just one very specific event, which is the loss of a spouse. And your thoughts on kind of extending that aspect. But really, to me, the more substantively interesting question is what are your thoughts about extending your work to move beyond the selection protection problem of marriage? In other words, people, people marry non-randomly. And it could be that the spouse that had passed had features or characteristics that predicted the resilience of the surviving spouse. This is a literature that I, I thought you were going to speak on, but I'm sure it'll be part two of your work. And just wanted to hear what you're thinking. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, it's, so in current work, we are extending this approach to other major life stressors. So we're looking, uh, we just had a paper accepted where we're looking at child bereavement, and we find a similar pattern in that a far fewer proportion of individuals are resilient across all outcomes examined when looking at a multidimensional approach. And your question pertaining to, right, the looking at this spouses as a unit and how they rely on one another. And within this paper, we didn't examine that in terms of how spousal characteristics, because depending on whether the surviving spouse is involved in caregiving related duties or, um, and also other health characteristics of the spouse that could influence how it is that adjustment really uh, follows. We've, done that in a previous paper where we just looked at one outcome, but I think within this data set, it's certainly possible to explore these avenues because it is a household panel and yeah, that'll keep me busy for another couple of years. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Certainly, Mark. Uh, Dr. Inferno, I was curious uh, in the resilience issue and the shock, there's a comparable literature on uh, like divorce and wound healing and things like that were more of a biological risk. And I was curious whether you had been looking at issues of, let's say, inflammation or um, even kind of cardiovascular markers. I'm thinking in particular of the Kiko Glaser work um, in terms of the consequences of divorce and kind of the shift in the biological risk of that individual long term. Uh, that's a really good uh, question and comment. Um, within this paper, that wasn't our focus to get more at the biological health risk, but I think in future papers we can certainly explore that. Um, the HILDA doesn't have biological health information, but like the health and retirement study does, and I'm quite familiar with that data set, and so that could be 
another uh, avenue to right to examine how the adversity can be linked to an increased um, health risk, right? Focusing on inflammation and also other markers of allostatic load as well. Dana? Sure. Good. Uh, Dr. Holman, um, I was wondering if you could comment on what you think might be the mechanisms of your intervention that seem to have some effect on some of the moms, and I'm wondering if the mom's own diet figures into their willingness to buy into uh, a healthy diet. And I'm also curious about for whom a French fry diet would be recommended. <laughs> well, your first question. Um, <laughs> so uh, we are exploring, a, uh, since we covered so much in our intervention, we're really interested in looking at what pieces worked and for whom they worked. Um, for the diet data that I presented, the, the interesting thing for me is that we found benefits really only among those that were consuming formula later in life, in infancy, <clears throat> as opposed to our weight outcomes paper where we, and, and other outcomes where we see similar effects across breastfed and formula fed infants. So I think in this group, um, the formula fed infants we know from literature are at greater risk for consuming less varied diets um, and also for lower acceptance of fruits and vegetables. So I think for this particular outcome, this was um, one piece of our guidance that may have been more particularly effective for um, mothers who were feeding formula. Um, as well as the other, the other characteristics we looked at um, that seemed to have um, effects on class membership, again, they were really um, related to the formula fed classes. So I think this particular set of the guidance really um, was helpful for mothers who were formula fed and may also have these other risk factors um, of low, less education, employment. There are also um, risk factors for more formula feeding. For french fry diets, um, <laughs> I don't think a french fry diet would be recommended for anyone, but... Um, Ronald McDonald? <laughs> Burger King? Yeah. Uh, I think everything in moderation uh, is key. However, for a nine-month-old, um, French fries are probably a, just a, more of a no-no. Once you get a little bit older, I think uh, some French fries every now and then is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> nice job with the, quick, with the trick question. <laughs> I'm going to invoke my privilege and ask you, Jackie, uh, um, you talked about, uh, um, for public health programs, uh, uh, long-term care and end-of-life conversations. Uh, um, does that have to do with caring for people on, for, for loved ones across the border, or is it also retirement planning because people re plan on uh, um, retirement elsewhere? Um, thank you for that question. So that's, I mean, I think that could be some of the background and the quantitative work that I presented, but it's something that I've explored. I mean, I think there might be, is ripe for future qualitative exploration. Um, in my own qualitative work with older adults, I found that it's both. So it's people, it's um, individuals who are coordinating the care of older adults uh, back in their place of origin. And a lot of the financial strain may co come from having to provide for regular medical care. Um, I used to be um, a case manager in San Francisco for immigrant families, and one of the stressors that I heard a lot was, I have to provide regularly for my mother's dialysis in, you know, this, the, in the country that she lives in, in the community that she lives in, and it's kind of this regular demand for financial strain. So it's financial and also logistic care coordination for family members who, um, live across borders, but also for older immigrant adults, there's often a, um, a desire to live one's end of life in one's place of origin. And that's kind of um, been explored by sociologists and others in terms of their hopes and wishes and whether that's you know the very end of life while they're still living or to be interred back in their country of origin. And um, you know their family members have to coordinate that. And, um, and often that wish doesn't come true or can be especially burdensome. So 
and my qualitative work, I've uncovered, you know, the burdens, but also kind of the hope involved with, um, with kind of imagining one's end of life back in one's place of origin. So remittance, uh, um, remittance amounts can vary over time. It's, yeah. Yeah. You can end up sending money home for a while and stop, and then if your parents, uh, um, as they age, and if they get needs, you're, you right. never know when the stress levels are going to get up for the right. salsa cohort. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's true, although they didn't collect remittances. So I'm working with another cohort study in California, Salinas Valley, that did collect, I mean, all, all of the, co the studies that I've been working with, I've just kind of latched onto, and it turns out they've asked all of these measures and didn't know it and didn't, because they've all been integrated with the community. Right. We're told by the community, you have to ask this, but then that wasn't the goal of the study and they didn't look at it. So I've latched on to, I think, four of these now. And um, so I have uh, working with one study, in a cohort study in Salinas, where they ask repeated measures of remittance sending so that we can look at kind of how that varies with their economic situation here, you know, and, um, and also some of the demands that are being made on them because we've asked, again, about kind of burden and requests for money and amounts as well. So we can look at the kind of the proportion of remittance sending to income. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Torres, I'm curious, uh, you've got this wonderfully um, sort of older sample of, 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 yeah. of, 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 of immigrant Americans. I'm, I'm wondering to the extent, I know you controlled, or you sort of evaluated nativity. I'm wondering if you have, for those who are foreign born, uh, their sort of age at migration, because a lot of, I imagine, a lot of your sample would be characterized by what Therese and Alejandro Portes would consider to be 0.5 generation, people who have migrated much later in life than traditional. But then you might have a mix of people who were young and aged in, uh, in San Francisco. Right. And so to the extent that people age in place, they may have more or less contact with uh, family and friends in the country of origin. I just yeah. want to know if you have that information. Yeah, no, so there's, um, there are multiple kind of issues that we considered and need to be considered in every study like this. And it's age at migration, the number of years spent here, but also the particular cohort in terms of political and his historical context. So, so um, the, this group was a cohort of um, people who, who migrated as braceros or after that program. So they engaged in circular migration. They had an average of 35 years in the United States, the immigrant subsample. And so, um, and at this, and given that they had an average of 35 years, very few of them were here for a short period of time. Most of them likely benefited if they were at some point undocumented from the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, so that all of them had we think, had the legal status to go back and forth and were part of that agricultural kind of circular migration where travel was more possible. And so even though, you know, they stayed here for longer periods of time, they were able to go back and forth. They had that fluidity of movement. And so um, we didn't control for years here, partly because we thought, I mean, there's a lot of kind of homogeneity in the immigrant cohort, although we were kind of starting to do that later on. Uh, and, and some other work on looking at inflammatory markers and how this tracks with other physical health outcomes. Um, but I think, right, so the cohort that I'm looking at in Salinas now, which is younger Mexican-American or Mexican-origin moms, um, we think the context of their migration is very different. Their ability to return is almost none. Um, and so um, that may mean, make the meaning of phone calls and so forth even more heightened uh, in terms of their symbolism, but it also may force them to be even more rooted here. Um, and so this was a cohort that was kind of characterized by that circular back and forth migration. I had a question for Dr. Inferno. One of the things I was thinking about was sort of the expectation of bereavement and thinking about death as a process. And I was wondering if you have any ability to leverage the sort of expectedness of the death and sort of thinking about what people may be doing um, pre-death in terms of, uh, you know, relying on social networks and thinking about that in terms of potential avenues for interventions. Uh, I think that's a great um, question and comment in terms of the more anticipation period and within this data set they don't particularly ask questions pertaining to that but there are ways to get around that in terms of more proxy 
uh, variables. So looking at the health of the spouse who passed away and, and seeing whether they number of chronic conditions, also whether they reported any disabilities or poor health and how connected they were. Uh, we've explored that in another paper and we found that um, par poor partner health before um, spousal loss was associated with better adaptation or better adjustment in the years thereafter. So it's certainly something we can explore further within this and other data sets. But I definitely think that period leading up to it, the anticipation, whether it's a sudden or um, long drawn out illness, I think that can have important ramifications for adjustment following. Mark? Last, last question, it's your prerogative as our distinguished scholar today. So Emily, I'm just intrigued by the, the breastfeeding um, start. There's a little bit of research that has talked about, is it the satiety that comes with the breast milk or is it a matter of the mode of trans transmission of the food? So is it milk or is it the breast which makes the kid just get frustrated and not take it. So I'm curious whether you've had a situation where you've fed using the bottle using breast milk. Have you ex have thought about that condition? I mean, it's a little odd question, so. No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, we actually are looking at this in our data set right now, um, looking at whether percentage of feeds from bottle, particularly amongst infants that are getting breast milk in a bottle Correct, is related yeah. to weight gain. And um, what we're finding is, yes, it yeah. does seem to matter much more than the type of milk itself. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Terrific. We will have uh, um, time after today's event to uh, um, get lunch and visit with our scholars. So uh, um, your questions, indeed, will get answered later. Uh, right now, we'd like to break for 15 minutes. Again, everyone, um, to the 10th Matilda White Riley Excellence Lecture. The recipient of this award has a research career that has advanced behavioral and social scientific knowledge in areas within NIH's mission. Um, every year, the recipient of this research also um, follows Dr. White Riley's vision through an expanded conceptualization, conceptualization of health and well being that includes effective cognitive, affective, and social functioning and quality of life. Behavioral and social sciences research results that improve the lives of people in society, illuminating, illuminating the complex and dynamic interplay among processes at multiple levels, influencing uh, influences of social and behavioral factors on physical health and the utility of this knowledge for clinical practice and health policy, life course perspectives on development, health, and well-being of individuals and societies, and research approaches that build theory and methods in the advancement of knowledge on health and well-being. The NIH community nominates researchers for this award, and the recipient is then selected by a committee that I need to thank now. Um, the committee volunteer, the, the members of this committee volunteer their time and effort to reading all of the nominations and then selecting one from among many deserving nominees. Please help me thank this year's committee of Anita Bechtold, Rebecca Campo, Rebecca Clark, Amelia Carricker, Bill Klein, and Lisa Onken. Give them a round of applause. And I, now I will present OBSSR's director, Dr. Bill Riley, who will introduce this year's Matilda White Riley nominee. Thank you, Eric. And again, thanks to all the nomination committee and all of those who no nominated uh, many, many numerous um, exceptional researchers um, for this year's award. But it's my pleasure this year for our 10th uh, Matilda White Riley Award to um, introduce Mark Hayward, um, Professor of Sociology, Director of Population Health Initiative at the University of Texas at Austin. Mark's research integrates life course theory and statistical and demographic techniques to interrogate how factors from across the life course influence morbidity and mortality. Beyond extensive research on mortality, his work has examined a variety of aspects of health including inflammation, cognitive impairment, disability, self-rated health, and positive aspects of health, including active life expectancy. A common thread throughout Mark's work is understanding how socioeconomic status, especially education, 
as well as gender, marital status, race, ethnicity, shape health inequalities in later life. He has also explored the role of behavioral factors in health and health disparities, including nutrition, body weight, and tobacco use, a very broad area of research across um, his entire career. In addition to his numerous scholarly, scholarly accomplishments, he has served in several professional leadership positions, he currently serves as uh, chair of the Aging and Life Course Section of the American Sociological Association, and is the chair-elect of the Sociology of Population Section of the ASA. Uh, he's currently a member of the Committee of Population, uh, National Academy of Sciences, and recently served on the National Advisory Committee for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Health and Society Scholars Program. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our 2017 Matilda White Riley Awardee, uh, Mark Hayward. You want to do the plaque? Well, let's do the let's do the picture. <laughs> uh, needless to say, I'm a little humbled, both by the nomination and the fact that I'm actually up here. Uh, I hope by the end of the talk today that you will observe that Matilda White Riley's fingertips, fingerprints are all over this talk. Um, I will tell one little story before I get rolling. When I was a baby social scientist, uh, when dinosaurs walked the earth, Matilda was here at the National Institute on Aging, and, and uh, she was also elected president of the ASA, American Sociological Association. So that year, everyone wanted to see Matilda White Riley. She was running a panel at the ASA meetings, and I happened to be a speaker on that panel. It was my first professional talk ever. And uh, I was scared to death, and the ballroom that the talk was in was packed. They wanted to see Matilda, what she looked like, right? <laughs> so I, with some trepidation, gave my talk, and when I was done, the session was over, Matilda came up to me and she said, I want to tell you that is the loveliest talk I have heard in a long time. Thank you so much. So that symbolized not just her intellectual contributions, but her mentorship and how she sponsored people and worked at building people's careers and getting people in the pipeline. So I am truly more than you can imagine. There are other stories uh, I won't tell you, I won't bore you with, but um, she had a huge impact on my life. Today I'm going to ask you to suspend a little bit of what you think you know about the relationship between what we think or we used to think is a very simple relationship between how much education one gets and U.S. mortality. And I'm going to put this in a very broad historical context both about the changing social policy environment, especially today, and what has been going on, I'm going to move us to that end. So I'm not going to start there. I'm going to move us to that end. Um, and hopefully, um, I will have some fellow travelers in thinking about these issues in a similar way when I finish this talk. I don't want to end. I want to begin with my acknowledgments to the funders who have really been so critical in uh, and supporting this work, as you can see, uh, it takes a community within NIH to support us, uh, both NICHD and NIA, and uh, we are incredibly grateful for the support that we've gotten over the years, and it's a variety of forms of support. As you'll see, I have a number of collaborators. Um, we also want to thank NCHS for the data preparation from the National Center for Health Statistics. A significant part of this work was dependent on their efforts. And I have a, a very vibrant group of colleagues who never hesitate to bust my chops at the University of Texas, and I am incredibly grateful to them. I also want to thank Matilda White Riley, because without her, I can honestly say I wouldn't be here. Um, and that's not, I'm not joking about that. Uh, I thought this picture captured her in a really nice way. So here are my key points in today's talk. Uh, what are the facts about this now seems to be a highly dynamic relationship 
between education and adult mortality, where we now have growing numbers of Americans who are at risk while others are living longer than ever before. So we're pulling apart at the ends of the educational spectrum, and I'll show you some real numbers. But you know, getting the facts right isn't as easy as it looks. As a demographer, I'm constantly told, don't we already know that? And um, I have to tell you that be careful what you wish for. The world is rarely in equilibrium. And because it is rarely in equilibrium, things change in unanticipated ways. And I'll give you some insights into what might be driving that. I'm also going to um, be brave and help and put forth a conceptual framework for understanding societal forces which incorporates technological change and changes in public policy that contribute to this dynamic association and how it's changing over time. You'll see this is really a Matilda White Riley influence. I'm going to talk about where the conceptual framework is leading us in terms of understanding and anticipating long-term trends in this association. And I'm finally going to end with an idea that's not, this, this, these words are not mine, but multiple Americas and what's under the hood of national statistics and nationally representative uh, studies. So um, the facts and just the facts about this association. One of the things that we were surprised with, at least at the national level, was, oh gosh, look, mortality rates went up. Um, this was last year's report. The, you know, if you were kind of to look at just within one year, you'd say, well, they went up, but they didn't go up that much. But they went up after a number of years of having been stalled. So the fact that they had been stalled and then they went up actually puts that going up in a little bit more context. You can see this kind of, it was one of the top stories in the New York Times. It spread. The media gets a hold of this. That's great. You can see another headline up here, what's killing middle-aged white American women. This is a, uh, an issue that has been part of our discussion, broadly speaking, uh, within the media. It certainly got a lot of attention. And of course, I can't avoid the fact that we have Angus Deaton and Ann Case and their work in their seminal study about um, mortality among white Americans, especially from suicide and substance abuse. Now, I want to put this case in Deaton work in context because these are all the studies, I've given you a list of studies that, are, that have basically said the same thing and led up to the case in Deaton work. You might think that I'm being catty about case in Deaton. I am not being catty. The reason it is so important is that we need this level of reliability in a kind of complex story. And if it takes a Nobel Prize winner to capture the attention of the American media, so be it. Because I applaud the fact that they were able to grab US headlines, even though we've been coming at this from a number of ways. Many different data sets, many different forms of investigation, many different approaches, statistically speaking. And the one nice thing is, we really do have a very consistent story. Any one of these studies can be deconstructed, right? I'm not going to be spending time for deconstruction. I'm going to be applauding the work that they do. Here's the, the, uh, the graph that uh, got a lot of us interested in what has been going on. If you look at the, I'm going to work on this mouse. If you look at this red line here, these are the all-cause mortality rates in the United States for U.S. Uh, whites. So we go across, it's pretty, it goes down a little bit, but it goes up, and we have a relatively stable but slightly increasing curve. Well, the context for this is really international because, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to make you dyslexic by the time I'm done, here's Germany. Here's France. Here's the UK and Canada, Australia, and Sweden. So over that entire period from 1990 through 2010, 
we saw dramatic declines in mortality for that age group, ages 45 to 54. And yet, for one demographic group within our own country, we saw the stalling and somewhat increase in what was going on with mortality. And I think the age group here is really important to keep in mind. The other part that got a lot of attention in the case in Deaton work is this idea of what, is the, what are the causes behind uh, what's been going on out there. I don't really want to get into um, issues of, of blogs that have done adjustments and so on and so forth with respect to this graph. I do want to point out, though, that that poisoning issue is a big deal. Um, we can talk later in Q&A if you want to know why I think it's a big deal, but I highly recommend taking a look at the work of Shannon Monat, who's done a great deal of work on the issue of poisonings and mortality for that age group. It's a really, really fine body of work. But here we see external causes coming into play for the most part. Um, it's really these kinds of external causes that have captured people's attention because they're behavioral in nature, right? They're fundamentally behavioral. This is the part where education comes in. I've just bracketed a little bit of the findings. Just look at the within the red brackets. And this is what happened to changes in mortality rates over this time period between, um, and I don't know why they do the most frequent date first and the oldest date last, but you know, this is a different way of approaching things. But um, you can see over from between 1999 and 2013, that the mortality rates for those people with a bachelor's degree and, and, old, and more went down. Um, so did some college, less. And there were uh, white non-Hispanics, uh, less than high school or high school degree only, their mortality rates increased over that time period. So this is the kind of stuff that's grabbing attention because you know it's coinciding also with the politics that are going on within the United States and the concern about the white working class and the overall quality of life of the white working class, because if you think about mortality as a social mirror, which I do, then you find these statistics to be highly troubling about the quality of life that people are experiencing in certain segments of this population. And what it really signifies, if mortality goes up, it means that the quality of life is going down. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. I've summarized on this slide um, what we think we know about the educational gradient in mortality for men and women, and I've given you the citations here as well. For non-Hispanic white women, the increasing gradient appears to be the consequences of increases in mortality for those with less than a high school education combined with really rapid declining mortality among women with a college education or more. Now, it's quite interesting that we never, ever concentrate on the declining mortality for the college educated, which is a phenomenally interesting story if we want to learn something from success. For the non-Hispanic white men, mortality for those with less than a high school education has remained relatively stable, while mortality again has dropped rapidly for those with advanced education. And while I won't get into the patterns for um, non-Hispanic whites and blacks, they differ quite dramatically. Um, and we can talk about that another time. Here I've given you, um, for whites, non-Hispanics, I've given you the actual numbers put out. Life expectancy at age 25 by years of schooling for non-Hispanic whites between 1990 and 2010. And these data are from using the US vital statistics they're a kind of revision of the Olshansky work. Um, this work incorporates some significant work on missing data problems. I won't get into the Bayesian imputation work, but it's, let me tell you, it matters. Missing data in these kinds of statistical investigations are a big deal, and they can really change the story if you don't pay attention to what's going on with missing data. But indeed, these are the patterns that we have seen. Now, I want you to think about what's going on here. We have declining life expectancy at age 25, and age 25 matters here. And we have, for, uh, for the uh, less than high school, we have increasing life expectancy for the college educated. Let's just look at where that's happening. 
This is a decomposition of the work of those life expectancies. So if I can maneuver, if I can maneuver the mouse, if you look at the women here, the white women with zero to 11 years of education, and we looked at the changes in their life expectancy between 1990 and 2010, what you would see is that bulge here in uh, the decline in life expectancy for those age groups. But I will say that declining life expectancy is actually occurring broadly across all of the age groups for that, um, for that educational category. And while we often think of the story as being restricted only to women, if you look at men, you'll see here that that age range here also is experiencing declining life expectancy, which happens to be balanced out by improvements in life expectancy at other ages. So if you say, hey, life expectancy at age 25 is stable, what you're ignoring is, is that in some parts of life, you see improvements in life expectancy over time, in other parts of life, you maybe see de declines in life expectancy. But if you go over, pardon me, I click, and it, whoops, I'm not doing well here. Let me just go back here. If you look over here at the 16 plus, there's your success story. It's the gains in life expectancy that people are acquiring over this time period, and they're acquiring them especially at the older ages. At all ages, yes, but especially at the older ages. So you think about this, as you go up the educational ladder, so to speak, you can see where ga who gains and who loses, but also where in the age range gains and losses are occurring. And lastly, I want to point out that probably what we're seeing is cohort phenomena. So this is the work by one of my former students, Ryan Masters. I just want you to look at, um, let's just go down for white women here since we've been talking about them. It's hard to make out these legends and so I'll talk what these are. This little tiny dotted line is women that are less than high school. Here's a dotted line for women who are, have high school and here's the solid line are women who have more than a high school education over this time period. And what you'll see is for some period of time for these birth cohorts, there was a declining mortality for that level of education. And then we see a stalling in this period for these birth cohorts and an increase. Notice through the entire period, however, we see this kind of dramatic decline again for people with more education. And it is very true for white males as well as white women, very similar patterns for both groups. As you can see, the cohort uh, characteristics for African Americans is quite different. The only thing I want you to see out of this slide is this is a study that we, this is a study you should never do. <clears throat> so Jennifer Montez is one of my former students and we, we did a study about exactly how does each, how is educational attainment, how is each additional year of education related to the risk of death? And one of the things that we discovered was we had a quite unusual functional form and we could learn a lot because different mechanisms appeared to be characterizing what was going on within those functional forms. And we used the National Longitudinal Mortality Study. So we had to get their help in estimating the models that we wanted, which I would never recommend doing again. That was hard. So we said, oh, let's see if we can replicate this work using the National Health Interviews, Interview Survey longitudinal followback. Don't replicate your own work. So we did, and Jennifer had been launched and she was off doing great things, and she called me one day and she goes, okay, tell me the bad news, tell me that you didn't replicate. I said, no. I said, with the different data set, we replicated exactly what was going on with the other data that we had published in demography. So it would have been a little embarrassing to say, oh, well, you know, blah, 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 we didn't replicate, but we did replicate. More than that, we actually began to carve up and look at the different time periods to see whether we have sort of an acceleration of what is going on, whether we could even see how, because from our perspective, when we were looking at the changes in functional form, they're actually changing quite fast. If you look at these time periods, 
and especially for women, those effects of advanced education are changing. They're significantly different from each other, and the time periods are very close. So what is going on out there is very rapid in terms of these educational differences. Why is that gradient growing? It's growing because you have increases in mortality at the lower levels of education, and you have rapid declines in mortality at the upper levels, and it's accelerating here. Now, we have nonlinearities here. You got to take account. So there's a mixture of mechanisms involved here. And when you see changes in functional form, you're probably seeing changes in mechanisms, which should give you some insights to the value of a rich description of what's going on out there in the world. So uh, now I'm a demographer, so conceptual frameworks usually consist of age and sex and gender and race. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I uh, deeply apologize to my more conceptually oriented colleagues. But we're going to try and bring institutions back into this discussion to understand what's going on with this dynamic association, this life course association between education and mortality. And we quickly realized as we were getting into this that, oh, guess what? Not, social institutions are dynamic too, and we need to understand the implications of institutional change. And realistically, we need to understand how cohorts are feeding into those different kinds of institutions. Because they're, they're really feeding in in quite different ways at different points of which exposures are being embodied and ultimately will affect mortality. So there are, there is a lot of work out there that has begun to look at this. Some of it, the upper left box is a box that is anchored by uh, Richard Easterlin and uh, uh, Fogel and Dora Costa. And that's a box really about, um, uh, in one case it's about the collection of knowledge, the institutionalization of knowledge that can be gained for institutions to improve health. And in Technophysio Evolution by uh, Dora and Bob is about the way in which we can control our own bodies, that humans have increased control. And part of that, of course, is rooted in institutional factors. There's another part that they didn't talk about, but I think is coming more into play. And I'm going to move us a little bit more in that direction today, which is political economy. Part of that is the market for health care, but it is, it's really much bigger than the market for health care. It's really many, many other things that are rooted in public policies, and we'll, I'll get to that in just a second. And the other thing we can't forget, especially if you're a demographer, is that there's a lot of changes in the population itself that are going on, and we have to pay attention to those things as well. If you think I'm going to complete this diagram and talk to you about all the results of this today, no, I'm not. But I'm going to highlight some of the things that we're going to be paying attention to and why we think in these terms. These are very macro, social, political, and economic forces at play that are getting played out on the ground in affecting people's mortality risk. So I'm, I wrote a book chapter. I'm embarrassed to say I should, I always tell my students never write a book chapter. Um, <laughs> it, always write referee journal articles, right? So, but I, I wrote a book chapter. And mostly because I was, uh, I had reread what Matilda had written, at, at, and this was long before I ever knew about the award. I had reread one of her papers, and I was thinking, well, you know, I really want to pay attention to kind of the forces. If I look back at Richard Easterlin's work or Bob Fogel's work, I really want to understand what changes in technology and changes in, so, in the social capacity and knowledge institutionalization, what it's, what's really, what does that mean? So I went back and I actually, I, I have to admit, I use Facebook for this. I crowdsourced some of it. You know, I came up with some of it on my own. But I did use Facebook, and I have a lot of very more knowledgeable colleagues and friends on Facebook that helped me fill in some of this graph. So the first part I'm going to define here is really between 1901 to 1950. And this is a, a, an era where we had massive technological innovation. And I talk a lot about that in terms of the 2001 to 2010, 2011 to 2020, thank God for refrigerators. But notice we have a lot of things that are happening, not all of which are positive. Spanish flu is not positive. But we had a lot of positive changes which were going to be broadly affecting all segments of the population, right? In some ways, 
all segments of the population were going to be affected. We knew, we, you know, eventually there was going to be diffusion more broad in the United States. I'm sorry, I talk with my hands and I'm brushing the microphone, so I'm going to have to. I don't know what I'm going to do. A fundamental change happened in the 1930s with the rise of the New Deal. This is where the American government redefined the contract between government and individuals, and you will see things like the TVA and the Rural Electrification Act, which helped, as a Texan, helped my state enormously in terms of providing electricity to large rural areas. We had the Social Security Act, the minimum wage, an important shift in home to hospital deliveries. Oh yeah, don't forget we invented DDT at that time. You see in 1940s more things that are going to really help, broadly speaking, the health of the American population. Less about inequality, but, move, but all boats are going to be rising a little bit, right? This culminated in the 1960s. I just gave the 1960s its own slide. <laughs> this, is really the, this is really the culmination of the New Deal in the form of great society. And it is all these things, imagine all of these things that really changed our lives. And if you can imagine cohorts, the younger cohorts are now going to face a different world compared to their parents because we have things like the Student Loan Act, which we forget really did fuel the rise of going to college in the United States. It was so important. Not just the GI Bill, it was that Student Loan Act that provided opportunities for people that you could never imagine, right? But we had a lot of things happen on, the, on both improving the quality of life of individuals <clears throat> and things that would directly affect their health. That some of these things are going to improve health for everyone. Some of these things are not going to improve health for everyone. They're going to improve health for some subgroups of the population. And we need to always think what improves health for everyone and what really is more targeted and not, doesn't improve health so much. Now I'm going to talk about a different era. It's an era that I think we haven't come to grips with yet but it's an era that I think we really have to begin to come to grips with if we want to understand what's going on in American health today and what's going to be happening to American health in the future, which is the rise of new federalism and the start of the federal devolution revolution. And what that means, of course, is, is that we started moving programs back to the states. The new federalism here is uh, giving states their rights to reclaim some power over some federal programs, I want to point out that at that time, at the beginning of that decade, there were no significant differences in life expectancy by state. I just want to set that stage right now, okay? There were no differences. Really, it was America, and it was American statistics. We're going to move away from that in a minute. In the 1980s got rolling, and we had this federal devolution that was in full swing. States becoming responsible for major social programs, and we began to see state differences in life expectancy accelerate. Right? I mean, we're talking fast. Um, there were other things going on besides these policy changes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Some of it was deregulation, some of it was public health policy, but a lot of what we saw was happening on a state by state basis. And to be honest, there's a lot of clustering that goes on out there in the world. In 1990 to 2000, believe it or not, in the Clinton administration, it really kind of cemented the devolution revolution. That 1996 Welfare Reform Act was a big deal. And um, states spent their uh, welfare grants at their discretion. That is an important component to have a handle on. And more than that, state EITCs get rolling. We just passed a period where we filled out our income tax. Some of us still do it on our own. Thank you, TurboTax. I'll give you a little shout out there in the <laughs> advertisement. States began to say um, the earned income tax credit is a really, really effective uh, anti-poverty program. Perhaps 
the most effective anti-poverty program that we have in place right now, and states began to supplement it. Well, some states don't have it, right? So we only have, I think, 26 states now that have EITCs. I'm trying to forget the exact, I can't remember the exact number. I sh should have my notes in front of me. And the, the amount of generosity of the EITC varies. So not every state has an additional EITC program. Not every state, and, and the states that do vary in their generosity levels. So you can see where I'm going. We have a lot of state differences in how we're investing in our populations. And if you, you wonder why legislatures have become political dogfights over everything, right? It's really all about the money and control that has been pushed back to the state level. And there's not as much fungibility as you might think at the state level, which causes a lot of concerns. So I've talked about state levels in terms of the kinds of things that they might do in terms of social welfare programs. This is an expansion. This is how other policy changes occurred state by state. This is the distribution of the 50 state cigarette sales taxes since 1950. In 1950, we're going, uh, what sales tax uh, on cigarettes, right? Notice that by 2014, 2010, 2014, we had this really wide dif differences in um, cigarette tax and what, how much cigarettes cost. <clears throat> I'm looking at my time here. How am I doing on time? So, okay. So, anyway, um, I used to do some consulting with my former governor, Ann Richards. And governor Richards says, she says, Mark, do you mean to tell me that if I had raised cigarette taxes that people would have stopped smoking? And I said, Governor, at the time, I said, at the time, Governor, we don't have evidence on that. But we do have evidence that people would not have started smoking. Now, since that time, there is an effect. You have to get pretty high in terms of cigarette tax to encourage stopping smoking. But the governor, she says, well, damn, I should have done that. <laughs> so it was one of the great times of my life to actually do a little hand-holding. She was rehabilitating Martha Stewart's reputation. She was in prison at the time. So I'm coming to the, to the end of my talk. I want to talk about multiple Americas and what's under the hood of national statistics and nationally representative studies. I can't avoid showing this graph. On the right-hand side, we have um, the life expectancy in the United States in 2010. You can't see the numbers, so don't worry about them, but I'll tell you about them. On the left, you see life expectancy in some, in some areas of Europe, some subnational areas of Europe. So we're looking within, kind of subnationally, what's going on. And you can see the color coding is exactly the same. So when we're looking at the South, which has an Appalachia, it has the same mortality life expectancies as much of the Eastern Europe does, OK? Not exactly what you would think of as an America that is bright and shining, beacon on the hill for population health. We never get to parts of France or parts of Italy or Spain, right? We never do. We overlap with Scotland, which has like one of the worst life expectancies around. But, you know, the other parts in the Mediterranean areas, we don't overlap really well. And in the United States, you can see that Minnesota is, really stands out, as does Hawaii, in terms of our overall state levels of life expectancy. That's where states are the best. I think this kind of subnational view is quite compelling. Because it's, it's been, remember when I said there were really no state differences? Now, the difference in the highest state and the worst state for women at birth is 7.4 years. That's enormous. I will, I'll just say it. I don't need a statistical test for that number. <laughs> this work is with Jennifer and Anna Zachikova, Jennifer Montez. Um, we have been looking at this issue, and I just want to 
talk you through these slides because I don't want you to look at the numbers. We actually have all 50 states. So we've said on uh, panel A on the upper left-hand side, we said, okay, uh, literally, what are the, what's the mortality rate for these states um, just adjusting for age? And you can see here's the bottom 10, and here's the upper 10 in terms of mortality rates. Now we say, okay, now we're going to adjust for race because people always think about you know, the usual suspects. This is what's going on out there in the world, the usual suspects. It's got to be a race issue. And as you can see, we see a little bit of movement for two states you know, that used to be part of that upper tail. But really, that, that graph doesn't change a lot when we're looking at that. Now we do the other usual suspects, and we start adjusting for a variety of individual level characteristics. And we see some flattening. So we're really stacking the deck against ourselves. We're not starting with states. We're starting with composition, even though composition and structural characteristics are intimately related. So don't get the idea that decomposition is the answer to the world. It's not. But actually, in the last graph in D is when we begin to con when we control for a variety of state structural and policy characteristics. We have a flat line here, people. That's a flat line. I, I can tell even by looking at that, there's no slope. So when we control for those kinds of infrastructural and policy changes that are out there in the world, this is just cross states right at one point in time, boom, that thing collapses. We've played this out. Now I'm going to look, I'm going to show you the education differences. This is the probability of being disabled by state and education. We're just looking at US born adults. 45 to 89, we've adjusted for age and gender. Here's um, the states are arrayed across the bottom, of course. And here's bachelor's degree or higher. And there's really not much variation in what's going on in terms of uh, the probability of being disabled. Here's the probability of being disabled if you have high school or some college. And we're beginning to see a little bit of a slope occurring here in what's going on. And here's when we have less than high school. So what happens in this study, and we have not done mortality yet because we have not thrown ourselves in the middle of a census data center, and we're still waiting to get funding from NIA. <laughs> I'll just point that out. We're working on this. Um, and then we're still working on our reviewers is what we're really working on. Um, what you see here is more of a ski slope. And uh, we've, done, we've done a lot of analysis about what alters that ski slope. The real issue is here when states invest in their populations in a variety of forms, we have a pretty small gradient down here at the end, okay, when states are investing. When states don't invest, it's the less well-educated, and it's actually states People think about selection. I'm sorry, the states where that effect is the, the gradient is the biggest are the states who have the most people at the low end of education, the least select group. I've heard the selection argument a thousand times. You want to try it on me? I'm ready for you. <laughs> so where do we go from here, and where do we think we should go? The first thing is uh, we know in our work that life course associations are really dynamic. And more than that, considering what is going on out there in the world, they should be. We should expect them to not be in equilibrium. The other thing that we should always pay attention to is those dynamic life course associations, they're not exogenous. They're endogenous to macro institutional forces that play out over long periods of time. And really, through cohorts, cohort exposures and embodiment of health risks. That's what's going on. The other thing that we've discovered, and we didn't start out with geography, trust me. This is not where we started out. We were not thinking about this. It's that these associations may lead us in unexpected directions, and the directions that pushed us was to actually think about this growing geographic inequality in population health and how populations are able to use or be constrained in using their resources to garner health advantage. Thank you very much.
seat up there. We'll take sure. some questions. I'll bring you. Mark, thank you. That was uh, uh, extremely provoking. Um, the, uh, uh, one, one of your colleagues has, has done research unpacking what's the largest single group, those who have a high school diploma but not a college uh, degree, and, and has found those to be very, that, that's, that's a big group, but they're very different groups of people in there. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about that and whether, I, I don't know, but are there big geographic differences in how that group is faring? Yeah, I, I, I can't talk about the geography of that group either, mostly because it's a fairly small group in some states, so it makes it difficult to look at the geographic detail. Um, the, the person you're referring to is Anna Zachikova, and she's, she's done some marvelous work. The work that she's shown is that, is that, the, uh, that some college group actually doesn't do very well. They do as well as high school people do. It probably will vary over time. The composition of what some college means, and this is a kind of where should we sh how we should think about educational attainment and add some... Um, meet to the number of years one is in school is to think about is one dropping out of college with debt so that we know that debt now, college debt, is a, a real risk to individuals. Um, is one actually going to a, getting an associate's degree and having some certification that will allow you to do well? My suspicion is we have some uh, mixture model People would like, like to say we have different classes of people, different classes of groups within that group itself, and I think the composition of that group is changing. Some college, I think, in the work that we look at in the older population was a good thing. Now I'm less sure how it's operating if it is actually referring to college dropout. So I think that, that we have to be very careful that that, that group is going to shift in its meaning for how we interpret that finding. So thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, extremely provocative. I wanted to um, link your work, and, and I applaud the idea of, of pushing the thought toward institutional processes and so forth. But related to you problematizing just these simple demographic variables of stagnant is a parallel set of literatures that are trying to look at social mobility. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about state-level processes and their mechanisms. That is, what, what do you think's operating here? And what, what kind of data do you think would be thoughtful for future research as we're trying to unpack the causal aspect of, of this program that you essentially are putting forward? Well, clearly we're moving in a way um, that moves us into a real historical perspective on what it has, how have states staged in different kinds of policies vis-a-vis -vis other things that are going on, but also looking for kind of hot spots where we have programs and changes that are following each other. Rarely do states treat policies as independent variables. So if you wanted to say, how does this policy change affect that outcome, good luck to you. You could run a randomized control trial, but I'm sure it wouldn't matter. Because ultimately, you have a lot of policies and changes that are co-occurring. It makes it very difficult to sort out that effect. Nonetheless, we are trying to look at, and I hope we can do this in my lifetime, is to look at these historical changes that are what's been going on and then begin to relate them to other kinds of changes that are going on at the population level. You ask me whether what kinds of data we would like. I'd like family data. So if I were thinking about um, really how is this transpiring, from a social mobility perspective, Mike, I'll use the example that I've used a lot of times with my 
classes, which is if you go to the American suburbs and you look at the older population, a lot of them are, college, are high school graduates, and they made it. They had union jobs, they have pensions, they have nice homes, they have a variety of things that define life in the middle class. Now, if their children only got a high school education, what kinds of lives do their children have? Their children experienced probably downward social mobility. And they, because the jobs that were necessary for their parents to gain that level of attainment, they're gone. And it puts them in a much more precarious economic situation and also a situation where social relationships are more fragile. Another part that is being played out here too, it's not just an individual level phenomena that we're seeing. It's a phenomena that's, that runs within families, within generations, and across generations. So that's a long-winded story, but it's really about uh, understanding and linking people. And if it goes back to the life course, linked lives, shared demise, if you will. So I want to link the lives. I want to begin to situate the lives. And um, the one thing people might be wondering is the effects of migration across, and um, Americans are stickier now than they've ever been before. So, I mean, we've controlled for migration. We, we do a lot of things that, in, here in the background. Um, migration really doesn't, people are not selecting themselves into good and bad places. They're pretty sticky. So, uh, but, we, but we use that information as well because we want to know where, peop, where people's bodies are exposed to which risks in their lives. It's complicated. Let's go to this mic and then I'll go to this. Hi, Mark. Great talk. Uh, in your conceptual framework in talking about the political economy, you kind of drew out the healthcare markets as being particularly important. And I'm wondering if you have something to say about how that fits in and the changes that we've had in healthcare, healthcare costs, healthcare markets yeah. uh, fit into the story that you're telling. Well, I think that there's um, more of a role for the healthcare market than we often think there is or that uh, show up in our data. So lots of people have looked at health insurance coverage, blah, 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 blah. I really think there's much more about the healthcare institution and how it's played out locally that we haven't really paid much attention to, which I think is a really important component to this. I, I use that as an example because I've heard social scientists say, every once in a while, well, gosh, health insurance coverage never matters. Um, and I go, really, if it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really matter. I said, well, do you choose your physician randomly? And they go, well, no. And I said, well, obviously, you must think that health care matters to your own health if you're behaving in a way that that works. And, I, and I, so I think it, it's, it plays a role. I'm not sure we're there at thinking about Healthcare as an institution, we have we have treated it as a highly individual level variable. But I will tell you, having saved my father three times from the brink of death in one of the worst hospital situations I can imagine, and I am not exaggerating, where I have done the diagnosis and made them do the tests, I know exactly how bad it can get in certain parts of this country. And, you, and it looks pretty. It's nice, shiny equipment. And having sat next to, just by accident in the airport, a doctor who ran their Heart Institute, I said, oh, you live here in Yuma, Arizona, too. He says, I said, what, do you like you know, where you're at? And he goes, he says, I've never worked with a more incompetent group of physicians in my life. I'm going on a job interview. I said, well, let me name those physicians for you. <laughs> that, so when I talk about health care, I'm, I'm, I think that's a box that we haven't unpacked as well as we should, um, and it does play a role, especially with mortality. So, and, I, and I'm not kidding about the three extra years of life ex that I gave my father. Um, so I, I don't know how to work with <laughs> Kind of sucks to be sure. So um, you showed. <laughs> no, I'm not insulting anyone. 
Um, so it showed that there's a dramatic difference between states in terms of life expectancy and the adjusting for state level infrastructure eliminates uh, almost all the dif um, differences. So I was actually wondering that whether the state level policy and infrastructure is going to interact with like census level demographic characteristics because for example in Ohio we have people in Cleveland who think about the lake and in Cincinnati people think about farming horse and these are drastically different kind of aggregates but they're all inf they're both influenced by the same level, uh, same state level policy. But I would imagine the legitimate question to ask is whether state level infrastructure is going to influ influence these areas differently, for, and uh, how does that vary across state as well? It does. So um, I'll tell you, we were on a mission from God <laughs> to get people to stop talking about neighborhoods. Because um, if I ever heard that, I shouldn't, I, I, I'll be more circumspect. Um, neighborhoods are fine, but er, when you get outside your house, you're going to deal with policies and the implementation of policies, good or bad, in ways that are going to dramatic effect, dramatically affect your opportunities and resources. So I'll just lay that out there. There are lots of things that neighborhoods do in terms of like your personal more agentic behaviors, but I was, we were, we were on a very specific, we have an agenda. I'm honest, we have an agenda. Let's make sure we bring those institutions back in. So we started with states. We actually started with fe the federal level, right? But then we moved from the federal, once we were observing what was going on at the federal level, moved down to the states, and we know within a state, I live in Texas, bigger than France, okay? <laughs> We have a state policy, how it's implemented on the local level, right, is good or bad. Do places have the resources? What are their constraints? If you're asking a police department or a hospital or whatever, a welfare agency to do whatever changes are going to be implemented, those effects are very localized. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So there's a linkage. Now think about all the things I'm saying and how we analyze data. Counties, lower levels of administrative units, states, they're not independent, okay? They're just not. In the world in which we work, statistically speaking, we really wanna push and add structure to our models and make them independent. At some point, we have to realize the dependencies and the dynamism and the connectedness of what's going on, both in terms of what's happening on one level, like multiple policies. We have defunding of education and defunding of Planned Parenthood, and we have defunding of this. They're all happening in my state legislature right now, right, at one time. At the same time, this stuff is getting played out on the ground, and State legislatures do one thing, counties, municipalities, townships, they're left with how do we do this? And they have their own responsibilities as well, right? So I'm, I'm making a pitch because we're still not yet methodologically at a point where we're gonna have to figure out how to untangle this ball of twine. And it is a ball of twine. So, but I'm warning you, when you bring structure to your models, when you're, gonna, you're going to shape that ball of twine in unintended ways. As a demographer, I would rather just look at that ball of twine for a little while, <laughs> just to make sure I get the facts right. Bill, did you have a question? Okay, we'll go to. So Mark, that was, that was excellent. I, there's a couple things I, well, first of all, I wanted to say, your, your point about social mobility I was just reading uh, Case and Deaton's sort of more drilled down analysis, Brookings, and they don't call it a conclusion, but it's similar to what you just said, right? That those in the 80s and 90s, the loss of manufacturing and clerical jobs and a lot of the jobs that people with high school and less education could work their way up into having a decent middle class, you know, provide for your family type of role just sort of went away. And, and they were really sort of lost. There was a whole generation of people still now they're lost in that group. Um, but I wanted to take the risk 
uh, to talk about policy for a second, because the concept of federalism was supposed to be one of the benefits, right, was that these were crucibles for policy experimentation. Mm -hmm. But your Ann Richards story sort of made me think about the fact that they're only crucibles if there's outcome data being communicated to policymakers and the policymakers are listening to that data and making adjustments to their policies. I, I think that is absolutely the, the case. That is absolute. Uh, you need outcome data and you need to look at some of this stuff as an experiment. The other thing you need to do is to think about how this stuff is actually related to health. So a lot of these changes that were being made, we're, we're not directly associated with health. And only now are we thinking in those terms, right? We didn't think in those terms historically when we were beginning to implement those programs. The other thing I will say about this kind of pushing the policy back to the states, I know people would want to attempt to make some uh, pejorative remarks about the kind of geographic concentration. I warn you not to do that because there are always exceptions to what's going on. States have budget constraints, right? So some states are rich, some states are poor. And the budget constraints are playing a role here in ways that most of us who, especially since I'm not a political scientist, not even if I stayed in a Holiday Inn Express, um, I just, I worry that that budget constraint is really playing a role that we are less certain about. So, you know, when you factor in the budget constraint, raising taxes, the difficulties of doing these things at a local state level, states make that kind of social policy experimentation becomes a little risky from a politics point of view. So. Uh, hello. Um, I'm curious about, oh, sorry, uh, first off, um, it was a really great and very enlightening lecture. Uh, I'm curious about figure two, um, when all like the morbid, morbidity causes like poisoning, lung cancer, suicide, you mentioned about poisoning. Um, I'm curious, actually I have two questions if that's right for me to ask. Sure. Um, how is poisoning really a big thing nowadays, like it's so high, and how does it relate to the education and U.S. adult? Yeah, so the poisoning refers uh, primarily to drug overdoses. Oh, that's and it's referring uh, to the opioid epidemic that oh. started. And now we have the heroin epidemic that has followed along behind the opioid <coughs> epidemic. Oh, okay. If you, there's always been pain out there in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe pain increased, as Bill was talking about in the Case and Deaton revised Brookings paper, where um, people were really, their, their lives were deteriorating in a material and social sense in a, in a significant way. They were, they were going downhill. Okay. Pain is likely to increase in that situation. It's a, like a perfect storm. You probably had some pain increase. You had um, a pharmaceutical industry that was armed and ready for this, and I, I'm not gonna blame them, but you, you, it just is like a really a perfect storm of unintended consequences. They provided incentives for doctors to prescribe opioids. A lot of the incentive programs were concentrated in rural and Appalachian areas. Notice those death rates were heavily geographically concentrated. Oh yes, absolutely. And more than that, Here's the other part for how is it that you take these drugs and why do you end up killing yourself? So if I say to you, would you rather take one large ibuprofen for 12 hours and not have to take two or three for every two, three hours, right? Which one would you pick? And most people would pick the one that says, oh, I want to go 12 hours, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess how the opioids were packaged? They were packaged in, a, in the 12 hour dose, not the dose where take a couple every few hours to manage your pain. No, we're gonna take the big whopper. And the big whopper has withdrawal consequences at some point. So when I say perfect storm, I mean, there were so many things that happened 
in this one time period, and it all came together. Oh. Does that help? Yeah, it actually makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, even the second question. Um, also, another thing, um, when you're talking about um, poisoning and, and drug overdose, that also relates to like the suicide increase, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the data on suicide are less clear uh, oh. than that graph would suggest. Okay, okay. Uh, once we do some appropriate age adjustments and things like that, the, the real standout the, during that period has to do with the opioid epidemic. And that's where people are actually concentrating their, their conversations. Okay. So, yeah, but I will say one time I was in Washington, D.C., and I'm sitting in the hotel bar, and I was here for a National Academy meeting, and I turned to the guy on the right, and they were all men, of course, in this bar late at night, the guy on the right, and I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a lobbyist for the National Rifle Association. And, and I turned to the guy on my left, and I said, what do you do? And he says, I'm a lobbyist for Big Pharma. <laughs> you see my graphs up there? <laughs> they said, well, what do you do? And I said, I, I study health. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? Then let's give Dr. Hayward another round of applause for sharing his work. Thank you very much. Oh, you are most welcome. I think Bill has a few closing comments, but I'm so glad that you came. So I will wrap us up. Uh, what a nice morning. What a great day, huh? This is, um, it's really nice to spend, I don't know, uh, many of the people in this room are uh, NIH types. Um, we spend probably more time than we would like um, doing administrative things and pushing paper. And there's no paper anymore, but pushing <laughs> electrons in various ways. It's really nice to spend a half a day sort of talking research and hearing some of the great research that both early stage investigators are doing and then uh, people of Mark's caliber uh, who have been doing this for many, many decades. So, so thank you all for, for being here and for doing that. I want to particularly thank um, the, the groups that put this together. So Erica Moore and the communications team that helps sort of coordinate of all this effort. So many thanks to you guys. Uh, Bill Elwood and all the many people who read many, many um, early stage investigator papers, select their four early stage investigators. So many thanks to all of those people. And again, as Erica noted, uh, the people who are part of the nomination process um, for the Matilda White Riley Excellence Award. Uh, so thank you all. I will tell you that in terms of wrap up, um, there's, this room is available until two. If you'd like to go grab something, to, there's a limited selection over here, but you're welcome <laughs> to go over to the uh, cafe if you want to just want to grab something and hang out here and eat lunch, um, if you'd like to do that. Um, and then we'll adjourn for the major part of the meeting. So thank you all for attending. Thanks so much.